Hello and good evening. Hi, uh, my name is Karen Kooni. I'm the director of the Viralist Centre for Art and Politics and really, really delighted, delighted to welcome you to the new school and to the third in a series of leadership um, discussions produced and organized and curated by our table. Um, it's a, a great joy to be presenting this program tonight, um, entitled Reaction and Action. I find the title itself already a provocation. I'm sure we'll have very interesting discussions about what comes first, you know, the reaction or the action, etc. Um, I would like to also thank in particular Jessica Porter, who is the new director of our table, and it's really wonderful to um, have a colleague in town that shares so many values um, of the Verily Center. And then again, I'd like to thank um, our table for uh, collaborating with us and bringing this incredibly important program to the new school. Um, it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Whitney Rudder, who is the president of the board of our table, and will say a few words about the organization. So thanks for coming. Um, so if you aren't familiar with Art Table, um, we are a membership organization that serves women in the visual arts, and many of you are members. I can see your faces, and I know you. Um, but some of you aren't, and if you're interested in learning more about the organization, love to share information with you after the event. And the event that we're having tonight is one of the events that our national organization puts on annually. We have a number of events that really deal with the issues surrounding art and art making and art thinking and curating and every uh, which way you can think about it. Um, and we also have events that reach out to the community. On Friday, we're doing an event with um, graduates of our programs where we talk to them about future career opportunities and our members share their learnings. And we also have a national chapter, chapters all around the country, so including you know, all the way from Northeast, uh, Northwest, Miami, you know, all over the country. Um, we share our learnings with our local community and we come together for these national events. So again, we are happy to share that information with you after the event. The event tonight was put on by our staff and our director here, Jessica Porter, who will be our moderator tonight, which is very exciting. Um, also, we would not be able to be here without the New School and the Vera List Center for Art and Politics, so thank you so much, Karen. And our sponsors tonight, so thank you Sotheby's and Bonhams for making this event possible, and for all of you for engaging with us in conversation. And now I'm going to turn it over to Jessica, who's going to introduce the entire panel. Thanks, Whitney. Thanks, Karen. And welcome to Reaction in Action in Art. A debate has long existed about where art falls on the spectrum between pleasure and politics, but the fact remains that there has always been political art. In every era, some artists feel compelled to create political art. And similarly, some institutions, organizations, galleries, and individuals commit to owning it and showing it. Tonight, our panelists will discuss their experiences with radical resistance and process in the art world. No doubt, politics invoke reaction, as does art. So the combination carries a powerful influence to engage or isolate. Before we get started, I want to make it clear that all of these panelists use their work to engage meaning meaningfully with our civic landscape, each in their own way. The point is, the deck is stacked. No one on this stage thinks that we should not be engaged in politics and art. So, to illuminate some of these questions, I may have to play devil's advocate. We will also have some time for you to have questions um, to also play that role if you choose to. You have uh, some brochures in front of you, a booklet uh, that has information on each of our panelists. Uh, so I'm just gonna point them out to you since you have their extensive bios, starting with who's closest to me, which is Karen Cuoni, director of Viralist Center for Art and Politics, who you just met. And then we have Tiana Webb-Evans, who's the founder and director of ESP Public Relations. And then I have Allison, <laughs> I was like, who's down there? Allison Friedman Weisberg, founder and executive director of Recess Activities. And finally, Monica Montgomery, who is the co-founder and strategic director of Museum Hue. We also had Sable Elise Smith, who's an interdisciplinary artist who was supposed to be on our panel tonight, but she is ill. So we will miss her, but we, we may um, end up talking about a few things that relate to her. So I'm gonna jump right in with my first question. 
which is, does political art need to reflect personal experience? And we're gonna, uh, many people are familiar with this image. It was from the Whitney Biennial from last year, um, which is a protester in front of Dana Schutz's painting um, about Emmett Till. Uh, and this has sparked a conversation across all of the arts about this question, does political art need to reflect personal experience? So who wants to jump in on this one? They were so chatty backstage. <laughs> I'll jump in. Thanks, um, Monica. Hi, friends. <laughs> I would say that it does not. Um, I think anyone can make art about anything because art is a medium of expression, but it's that much more authentic and compelling when a lived experience is an overlay and a lens with the art that's being made, when cultural sensitivity is employed with the art that's being made. But it doesn't preclude someone else from making that art, but there needs to be a real um, inner thoughtfulness in the way they approach it so as not to offend, um, erase, and so on. So I would say everyone can make any kind of art, but we have to be thoughtful in this moment in time with the polarization that exists on how we're approaching different communities and different topics. I would. I, I also think that it's deeply important for institutions to frame work properly. And I think that um, you're right to say that anyone can make anything they want, but it's different to make work in the privacy of one's own studio than to engage the public and to can engage, um, you know, um, sort of a wider presence around that piece. And so I think an institution has a responsibility to be thoughtful um, and to provide the right uh, context and background um, and I think in terms of the artist, it, the artist has a responsibility to engage in practices of care um, for their intended audience. Um, and that may be different for each individual artist who they imagine as their, as their public. Um, but I think good artists who engage in rigor, um, and I think Dana is a good artist, but I think that this, um, that her piece was miscontextualized and that, um, in my humble opinion, it did not belong in that exhibition. I'd like to jump in here, yes. I agree with you both. Um, I've thought a lot about this piece and had a lot of conversations. Um, many colleagues reached out because they really didn't understand what the big deal was. And we sit in a room of people who may not understand why it was a big deal. Um, the issue here is not the Dana making, it's not about Dana making the piece. Um, as someone who loves and appreciates her work um, and her practice as an artist, I was very saddened by this occurrence. She made that piece as a mother who was empathetic to um, a horrific occurrence and tragedy. And she had to express that through her work. The curators unknowingly thought it was powerful that she did this, but they also don't have a relationship to the experience. So I wanted to take an opportunity to sort of explain to those of you who might not understand why this was a big deal. Because as um, an African-American person, this image is part of a collective trauma that we share and a pain body that we share and that we own. Um, and if you have not heard of Emmett Till, if you have not grown up with that image, if you don't live in the fear and the knowing of that image and understand that that legacy of, of fear um, of what happens to him continues to this day through police violence, um, et cetera, et cetera, and the idea of the ownership of your own body and the context within the institution, a powerful institution, that's where the offense occurred. So for me, it was really important when you asked this question to be able to really clarify, because people think it's as simple as, well, she's an artist and she should have freedom to paint and you know she cared about this work, but what 
no one realized in that context and sort of institutional responsibility and having someone in the room as part of this process who can speak to it is that this, is, this image is a trigger. There are images that are part of our experience that other people have not had to contend with or sort of live with. And that's sort of the heart of why this was so contentious. So do you think it, make it makes a bit of a difference if the art is a commodity rather than a museum piece just for show, or no difference? <laughs> I'll double back. I mean, I, I, I definitely art, well, there's been incredible, sh as, the, as the market person on this panel, I mean, there's an incredible shift in interest in political art for reasons that I think many times are less than noble. Um, so, you know, it as a commodity, it wasn't being sold on a Whitney Biennial wall, but there also is the issue of, of, of power and value. I just have one thing to add, and, you know, everything that you all said is very much what I feel about um, in this case as well, but um, what this also made clear is that every exhibition and every activity of a museum and, you know, many other outlets as well, um, is really tied so specifically to the moment. And um, in a, this case of this exhibition, of course, it's being planned for a year or a year and a half, but the moment it hits the public, you have to be prepared as an institution for the potential consequences of it. And um, what this taught us, I think, also was just a useful reminder is how much time is needed to create a context in which a work can be properly received. And I could imagine that you know, a show could include this work at this moment in the US, but not the way it was presented, not the way it was, uh, the, it was um, uh, or the lack of reaction that came from the museum once it was clear that this really was a very painful and hurtful and incredibly um, questionable or offensive uh, proposition by the curators. So I think we all need to take enough time to understand what the issues are and then work accordingly and develop protocols and um, contexts and situations where maybe something like um, this painting even could be seen. You bring up a really um, interesting kind of perspective because I believe the Whitney also took it down for a short period of time and then put it back up and had you know claimed to you know take it down not in reference to the activism that was going around it in the protest so it's it was a water it's, leak it was yeah it was one week exactly a water leak oh, oh yes it was a water leak mm -hmm. but it, it just seemed very mm -hmm. right and i think that there was a lot of conversation about that and how to handle it as an institution can I speak to how to handle it? Yes. <laughs> I think that um, my work as another hat I wear as an inclusion diversity equity consultant, I feel like we're in an era where we have to be comfortable failing forward and that failure is not um, a destination, but that we can admit wrongdoing individually, institutionally, to one another in our own spaces and abroad and in the world. And so we can't be so dead set on the, you know, the institution is the hierarchy and the power rests there, that institutions and stewards of them can't be comfortable admitting or, or empathizing with people who are saying, you know what, this is affecting me and you're harming me and you're harming those like me and we need answers and we need justice. We need you know, restorative justice. Like I think we have to be much more comfortable in this era so that we don't seem um, stiff, um, so that we don't seem kind of culturally insensitive to be able to say, you know what, this is something that's happening. It's coming up in the news. A lot of times there's a whole crisis PR element and I'm sure you can speak to that, Tiana, but like how can we as institutional stewards do better to the communities that we serve? Do you feel as though the institutions that you work with understand the harm? Because I think, you know, one of the things that I'm really passionate about is proximity, which is why I ended up on the market side. Um, I don't think there's a proximity to an experience. And to understand why it's harmful, I think, is the departure point. 
and I, I have a sense that a lot of people don't understand why it's harmful. If, if people understood why it was harmful, a lot of the work that is done by um, my cohorts on this panel <laughs> would be a lot easier. Um, but I think the understanding why it's harmful in a broader sense, I mean, if I feel like people collectively understood why it was harmful, we wouldn't have many of the problems we have today, you know? Well, from what I've seen, most institutions um, are run by a monolithic set of white people. Some aren't, props to them. But I think the ones that are um, don't understand the harm because they haven't lived through it and they don't have diverse sets of eyes and diverse sets of perspectives to see, okay, this is why we shouldn't do that. This is why we should course correct. And so coming from one lived experience, they wouldn't see, they wouldn't understand. Certainly there are people that are more progressive um, in the art world, but I think it takes a real true um, dedication to diversity and inclusion and having a variety of perspectives in leadership to be able to understand, you know what, there's harm here and here's how we can approach it and to not even make those mistakes in the future. So what would failing forward have looked like in this instance? For the Whitney? Yeah. <laughs> Anyone from the Whitney here? No. Um, I don't know. I, I, I had that thought too. I, I, <laughs> I said backstage that there's a lot of brilliance in this room. It's not just up here. I don't know. Is this a moment to toss it to the audience? Is this like a turn and talk moment? Because I'd love to hear from other people what they think failing forward would look like. Do we have anyone from the Whitney or someone who wants to speak to this issue? Hi. I, um, <laughs> very interesting uh, conversation. And I was sort of thinking, um, would it have been appropriate for the Whitney to just say, okay, wait a minute, we didn't look at it from all points of view, can we create a conversation and an evening like that to really hear all the points of view and, and, and understand where we were right, where we were wrong, or and so on. Would it helped you. Can I speak to that, respond to that? Um, it, was, it was really interesting before I came here, um, I was with one of Dana's collaborators. And the truth of the matter is that the Whitney did fail in that moment because Dana wanted to have the conversation. She was willing to expose herself to the public. She was willing to expose herself to the criticism because she came by the work and by the experience honestly and she wanted to share that. And also share the things that she did not know um, so I do think the Whitney um, could have done better. I also want to say just a couple of words um, about, again, you know, going back to the time and, or the duration and the impact of an exhibition. So these discussions, of course, could have continued long after the biennial closed. And in just, I, I don't even need to or mean to defend the Whitney, but I know that in terms of concerns for indigenous culture making, there is a very, very different approach being practiced by the museum where ongoing conversations happen in various public events and forums that are linked to exhibitions at the museums or at the museum or not. So you have both, you know, at at that particular museum, and I do think um, some of the work that's happening, maybe more instigated by the education department at the museum, is absolutely exemplary. So switching gears a little bit, uh, in the art world, we're a little guilty of being liberal and telling one side of history when we're showing artwork. So I wanted to um, put these two slides up um, by two different artists who are documenting what's going on in the political realm since uh, Trump uh, was elected. And we have the image on the right, which is by Kristen Mays and has been picked up pretty widely um, as you know, a, a symbol of protest, of um, camaraderie, of all kinds of things. And then we have the image on the left um, of a sculpture that an artist had to take down off of their site, even though they were claiming to just document, be documenting part of history as well, not promoting anything related to Trump. So are we only telling one side of the story when we do this? <laughs> uh, 
I just want to say that, you know, of course this country is getting more and more polari polarized and that applies to many other countries as well. But it is not as if there were, you know, one side and the other side. So I am also one who is deeply opposed to the notion of the cores of the converted because I don't think that exists. So I think in every single uh, cultural expression or exhibition or artwork, you know, we ideally put out an incredibly complex and um, multi-layered and dense proposition of how to engage with issues in this world. And I think it's, it doesn't serve the art and it doesn't serve the political discourse in the country if we say, well, it's all progressive or it's all liberal or it's all predictable. I don't think that's the case. I also think, though, that um, at least as, you know, an organization that has um, a mission statement, um, and I can speak for myself that the mission statement of the organization that I run is one that is at its core is about inclusivity and sort of thinking expansively about what a creative public looks and feels like and maintaining multiple inroads for, uh, you know, these notions are aligned with a more progressive politic. Um, and I don't think it's valuable to apologize for that at any point. So, you know, I, I think that there are organizations that exist that produce culture and art that have a different charitable mission. Um, but I think to run an organization with integrity, uh, you have to uphold the ideals of your mission. And if those are, you know, progressive politics, then, then you, you should stand by that. So Tiana, I'm gonna pick on you for a second, just because you are in the PR world and in this marketing role. I mean, how would you handle the piece on the left? <laughs> Sorry. Um, what's really interesting, just to be honest to um, the room, is that my role is typically behind the scenes. And being out in front of the audience, for my friends in the audience who know me well, yes, I'm looking at you too, um, my personal politics and my work rarely intersect. But at the same time, there is guidance I'm able to provide my clients that obviously someone else would not be able to. So as far as this is concerned, I really, again, am an advocate of proximity. The examination or the presentation of diversity as spectacle as curiosity is something that um, I don't necessarily subscribe to. I do think that this conversation is important. The issue is that we're not talking to each other. So to be able to have a dialogue between someone who might want to make America great again for themselves and not so great for someone else is a valuable conversation for me. I've spent my life being the interpreter of an experience. I worked in an auction house, an art auction house, for a number of years. For those of you in the business, you know exactly what that means. So I spend a lot of time interpreting, you know, for me it's very important to have a seat at the table. So my approach, you know, we were talking about activism with a capital A, and activism with a small a. My approach to activism was to have a seat at the table. And if I have a seat at the table, I can be that person to say, hey, 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 that, that doesn't work. At the same time, in this context, I'm very interested. My biggest interest at this point is to have a dialogue about whiteness and constructs of race in this country in the context of the black experience as well. Because the thing is that once you're looking at one side of the story, that side becomes, whether it's fetishized, exoticized, whatever the case may be, people are not aware that they're within a construct that was designed and created as a power structure to have a specific outcome. So when artists like this come on, let's talk. You know, I feel like, as an institution, it's different. I don't work within institutions in the market. You can, 
you can push the envelope in a different kind of way. Um, but I do think that voice needs to be, well, the funny thing is that vo voice has always been heard. I also find it curious, like, do they, you know, does this person need a voice? That's been the only voice, that's why <laughs> we're all sitting here. Um, but the, the bottom line is that we need to be, we, you know, someone said that we're just screaming into a silo, like we're preaching to the converted. Um, if you're here to ha hear this conversation, you have a level of interest in what our experiences are. Um, I'm interested, I, I wanna go to um, Oklahoma and North Dakota and Idaho, and that's where I wanna have a conversation. So, um, you know, as far as PR is concerned for an institution worried about funding, I don't think I'd be the right person to speak to that because I personally would defend the right for this work to also be shown. I was just gonna jump in um, since we're talking about middle America. <laughs> I think um, the conversation that everyone's like, let's have it, like, I think we have to really get clear on like, what that will look like. So some people are having conversations digitally online. Some people are having town hall forums. Some people are protesters and counter protesters screaming at each other in the street. Like what form does a conversation take and how we as stewards of the arts, as lovers of the arts, as arts professionals can be involved in making sure that sides are heard. Recently, through my work with Museum of Impact, um, we're a mobile social justice museum. We were invited to Mississippi to the town where um, Emmett Till's um, kind of memorial has just been desecrated repeatedly. Um, and there's a university there and they want us to come and do like a week long residency, do a pop up, teach classes to some students, talk about social justice and art. And so I was thinking like, okay, all right, I can get my head around this. But then I was thinking like I am in imminent danger in this place because the professor explained like this is the politics, this is the Trump state, you know, there have been incidents and nooses left in different places and I'm like, wow, but alternatively, this is also the work I came to do. I can't stay in the progressive Northeast and say I'm having the conversation when there's a lot of like politics and like-minded people. There are other parts of the country that need this energy, this work, this provocativeness. And so having the conversation often looks like coming outside of our comfort zones to see how the art is in conversation and beyond. So when you're traveling to some of these other areas, especially with your, your mobile museum idea, and you encounter another arts institution that is showing hateful politics. Is that, I mean, do you try to build an education experience around something like that, or how do you handle it? It definitely gives me pause. Um, I usually am already armed with prompts and quotes for every, <laughs> everywhere I go. Um, and so certainly I would reach out, like if I'm being hosted by a university, I'd say let's get some other community organizations in the mix. If there's a museum hosting me, it's like how can we get other students in the mix? But I think talking about, hey, here's what other parts of the country are experiencing and feeling about the politics, the xenophobia, whatever we're talking about, and then saying, let's think how we can find common threads and potentially build tolerance, if that is the spirit of the area that I'm in, at the very least getting people to come outside of their own worldview and realize there are other worldviews. But it's, it's like not work that can even occur in a week or a weekend, like it takes time and it's sustained, and so I'm still new to just the concept of how to engage over time with places like this. Because once I go home, the hope is that the conversations will continue. So, to be determined. I think, I think there's also, you know, entire schools of thought and forms of art making that are not objects that exist without context in a gallery. So, I think there's um, less of an echo chamber problem when um, art is made in consort with publics um, and when you're able to sort of um, have the artist present to advocate for their um, reasoning and value system and then it engenders a more dynamic conversation. Um, and even if the conversation becomes contentious, um, when you're talking about an, an object that's divorced from humans, it, it's a much different kind of conversation than when you have artists who are either making work with people or um, engaging communities directly in that process. Um, it makes, even if the conversation is polarizing, there's a lot more space for dialogue, um, I think, in my experience. 
I just want to um, put out one more word of caution about the assumption that we're all progressive here in New York and that the you know, East Coast is, um, by and large, very liberal. I think we have to be very, very careful and pay close attention to what's actually happening in this city um, and recognize signals of you know, political changes that we might dismiss or just not pay attention to. That's a good point. Uh, Alison, I want to go back on something that you just touched on, and that is artists in their early stages. And this is something you know we were going to talk a little bit about with Sable joining us, and you have worked with Sable, so I, I think you can speak to this a little bit about how important is it for an artist to have a gallery that will represent political work. That will, you know, is it important to just have the work shown anywhere, or to have a specific gallery? that you know, has a political mission, and I, I have an image of one of Sable's pieces um, that was at the new museum. Um, I feel terrible talking about Sable when she should be right here. Um, but I have had the wonderful opportunity of realizing a number of projects with Sable over the years. Um, and I think um, Sable is an incredible example of someone who, uh, has really engaged in lots of different kinds of institutions. So she's worked with Recess, um, a nonprofit organization, um, and she's done two projects with us. She's a professor at VCU um, and has done multiple um, museum, uh, has museum presence and just opened a gallery show at JTT this past weekend, which is perhaps why she's sick. Um, but the and it, uh, it is a gallery with a political mission, so that's why. Yeah, and yeah, that's a really. That? I think one of the um, one of the things about um, more emerging artists is there's so many different ways to um, promote oneself, and so the need for a gallery um, now is different than it was even 10 years ago. And I think the role of the gallery as a result is different and is changing. Um, but also the, the galleries themselves often are mission driven in a particular way, which is new um, for the landscape. Um, but I think whereas 10 years ago it would have been really radical for an artist to choose not to have a gallery, many artists now are making that choice and are finding different ways of being successful. Um, we, I think the economics of it can't be minimized, right? Like to survive solely making art, it's incredibly, incredibly difficult, especially in a city like New York. Um, and so if you're not also planning to teach and um, you know do a million other things to support yourself, um, I think it's difficult not to have a gallery for sure. Um, but there are many alternatives that exist now that just didn't several years ago, even just social media. We've heard a bit about people losing their jobs at institutions for planning shows that are surrounding political art or, or art that's a bit controversial. How, how do you handle that when that lands on your lap? If you want to talk about Lauren Woods's show. Yes, yes. that's what I was um. thinking of. Thank you, Tiana. <laughs> um, Lauren is incredible and, and, and very brave. And I think that, you know, from an institutional standpoint, curatorial, curatorial standpoint, given where the show was taking place, um, it was brave. And I think that's one of the cases where you really see the structures that we live within in this country. Um, and the efforts to which people will go to deny that those structures exist. Um, I think showing political work right now at the precipice of hopefully November 6 goes well, but um, continuing turning backwards um, is important as, as, as Karine said, it's, it's of the moment um, and it feels responsible you know, I think it's very hard to exist no matter who, if you have a, well, I don't want to say if you have a conscience that's being judgmental, but <laughs> if, you, if you have progressive politics and you 
are in the world with other people and sensitive to other people, it's really, really hard to ignore it. And I think as a cultural institution, just unpacking the idea of culture, what is your culture? What do you subscribe to? I think that's the debate that a lot of people don't really speak about. What is the culture of the institution? And I think that you can have shows in an institution for 10 years and until you sort of press those buttons, you, you know, you're sort of surprised. So I think it's an unfortunate occurrence. I hope that we continue to, to keep that occurrence in the news um, so people understand. But we've seen a number of high profile departures recently um, because of politics. I mean, you think of cultural institutions, we're a country that doesn't really support culture. So how do those cultures, how do those institutions survive? Right? It's the board. The board has a lot of power. Yes, you know, um, they want to keep their doors open. So I think from an institutional standpoint, there's always this dance. And then you look at um, museums that are in, in different parts of the country or even here. Um, there's a lot more that goes into it than um, there's a good artist. I just want to do this exhibition. I think that's what the, what the fallout is. We really pushed a lot of buttons as far as personal politics. Allison and Monica, you both have your own institutions, so you can show what you want and do kind of what you want. Was that a factor in making kind of a career decision about you know, having that flexibility in your life to do those things rather than risk getting fired to, to show the work that you want to show? <laughs> Um, I don't think of recess as my own institution. Um, I think of myself as accountable to the rest of the staff, to our audiences, to the boards, certainly, um, to our program participants, to our artists. Um, and we have a very horizontal structure of governance as well. Um, and so um, I think that the organization has a mission to um, advance inclusivity and to advance, um, you know, uh, uh, to advance the um, more progressive politics that we've discussed here today. Um, and I very much feel accountable to that mission. Um, but I wouldn't say that the organization exists so that, certainly not so that I can um, or even so that the organization can just sort of advance our own political agenda, there's a very um, important and hopefully rigorous process that uh, independent organizations should go through in order to um, develop structures of accountability, um, both to themselves at the end of the day, but also to their public and to their participants. So I don't know that I answered your question, but... Um, <laughs> Maybe, maybe you'll do a better job. <laughs> I would say um, that I'm more of a build your own table kind of girl. And so I know um, just when I first entered the art world and I observed and I started as the lowly unpaid intern, the volunteer, the get coffee girl, and I'm like, it's gonna take decades to revolutionize any of these spaces that currently exist. And I don't have that kind of time. I'm gonna start things in concert with others. I'm gonna start things individually that I think should exist in the world. I'm gonna fill gaps and voids where I see them. I'm gonna make sure that they're speaking truth to power and that people at the margins are centered. And so I do feel very close um, to the organizations that I've created and now even that others are involved, there's a lot of blood, sweat and tears that went into the formation of them. And just to be able to be independent and withstand sometimes the harsh gazes of people that are like, what, what are you doing again? You did what? You started what? Oh, that's cute. You know, like that's kind of the energy sometimes um, that onlookers can bring. But I do think there is a freedom. There's a liberation that comes when you know that you've started with progressive politics, with equity at the core, with inclusive people um, that believe in the vision of social justice as a mandate. And so that then there's a freedom to move in a certain way. And so even though it's still hard to, again, just operate in the New York art world, the national art world. I think it's really important that some people take that route and decide to be independent and form things so that 50 years from now, there can be a new generation of progressive institutions. I think too, just to build off what you're saying, the 
I have a background in museum work, so have very much um, been privy to larger, more bureaucratic institutions. Um, and one of the things about operating independently that is an incredible privilege um, is the ability to adapt and be flexible um, and to really listen actively to um, the folks that you're partnering with. So whether it's your artists or your participants or your audiences, um, there's a real nimbleness to an independent organization that, um, that I found to be sort of endlessly frustrating in a larger institution. I concur. I could maybe just add something about the risk um, and that we, depending on the values that our organizations represent or the culture, um, you know, we engage with different kinds of risks. And um, at times, you know, if times are so fraud, you know, it may also entail risking your position and putting the work out there and trying to plan for it to last as long as possible. But, you know, it might happen that um, we... We can't um, expect a, a um, kind of an acad academic appointment where you're just appointed for life and by the virtue of a certain um, professional history. So is there a line between leadership and activism? Well, <laughs> I was saying backstage um, that certainly there's a spectrum, that they're on a continuum. Both of them involve making tough decisions. Both of them involve being responsible and accountable to others beyond yourself, finding consensus, um, you know, organizing. But I think activism has more of an undertone of sacrifice um, and just a, a, a deep passion, whereas leadership, I think, is more stewarding, making sound decisions on behalf of all involved, you, the, the risk that you were just talking about might not be as inherent in a leadership track rather than an activist track. But I do think that those two worlds fuse. I see myself as an activist leader in many senses. And activism doesn't mean you have to be on the front lines marching in the street every day. There's a lot of small choices you can make towards advancing the betterment of humanity or whatever cause that you care about. But I do think that um, activism and leadership intersects in my world and in many other worlds, and certainly there should be no one forced to choose, right? It, it's, it's a spectrum. We, um, um, at the Verily Center, we organize these research programs over the course of two years, and we have a theme for all of these two-year-long programs. And at the moment, we dedicated um, all, very, our initiatives and you know, fellowships and whatever it is to the notion of art as a political practice. Um, so that means that you know everything is actually really um, based on very explicit values. We are accountable to, but um, clearly identified audiences. It has changed the structure of the organization. So um, the it also means that there is less of a distinction, which I actually find hard to see between leadership and activism, but we enact our values through our actions and programs and therefore are, you know, hopefully, certainly activists and maybe also um, showing or enacting a model that is useful for other organizations. Um, Tiana and I were talking, um, we talked about this uh, a little bit backstage, but the difference between um, being sort of a, a capital A activist, which is I think a title that, um, that I don't deserve because I haven't um, made the kind of sacrifices that um, someone with that title has. Like I have two children at home and there is behavior that I wouldn't engage in because it would put my um, family in jeopardy and um, so there are choices that I've made in the way that I live my life that I don't think qualify as a capital A activist um, but I do think that a leadership position um, sort of whether you like it or not um, puts you in a position of activating um, and so in the more lowercase a register of the word that if you sort of um, find yourself in a leadership position, by default, you are um, serving somewhat of an activist role. And I think it's important to be aware of that, um, especially as leadership positions are often associated with power and privilege. Um, to piggyback off of that, um, yes. You know, there's a very big difference between 
being at a table and making space for someone and going to Mississippi. I'm not going to Mississippi. Um, I will make sure you have everything you need to go to Mississippi. <laughs> but as a mother of three children, I'm terrified. Um, and, that's, and then that's serious. And we take that very seriously, especially growing up with a tradition of scholarship and activism. That's a dedication that, you know, um, like you said, you know, when you have people that are depending on you, it's, it's, it's kind of difficult. And there are people who have who've been activists who have been parents as well. Um, but for me personally, I think that besides my commitment to the nonprofit activist organizations that I'm personally involved in, um, my activism sort of happens on a day-to-day -day basis because I'm in conversation with people who are powerful all the time within the art world. And it was very important to me to make space, to make space for others, to make space for women, to make space for people of color, to make space for new ideas. I see myself as a catalyst and interpreter. Um, I can speak, I, it's, there's two languages, and I can speak both of them, and both of them really well. Um, so my activism is rattling the cages. I think I'm, I'm always, I've always been very sort of uh, market focused, and the power dynamics within the market are a fascinating thing to me, and I think that's where um, my personal sweet spot is, and also ushering in scores of artists into that stream and system. Um, so that's where my activism lies. It's a, it's a, it's a lot less public, um, but for the people who know me, know that I take it very seriously, and um, no matter what, who I'm in front of or where I am, I'm going to be myself. So. Um, and that's taken a lot of sort of personal toll um, and emotional toll um, because, you know, just, can I speak to you, Jessica, a little bit? I don't, I don't want to rattle it too much, but I remember about 20 years ago when I found out, when is it, is it 20 years? How old is our table? Yeah. 40. 40, Going wow. 40. Okay, so 20 years when I was like, We just know. look younger. I know, exactly. <laughs> A puppy in the window saying, ooh, I want to be in this art world. Um, and uh, my mentor, Laurie Sims, was, you know, an art table. I wanted to be an art table lady. You know, it was very, very exciting. Um, it was a different world. What it meant to be in the mainstream art world was extraordinarily different. Um, and I think that's something that we don't talk about a lot. I, I was like, wow, if I was 20-something today, God only knows what I would have done. But that was not my time. Um, at the time where I was coming into the art world, there were two different art worlds. There wasn't this integration of a room, and I'm really excited about Art Table and your leadership, um, even having this discussion. You know, 10 years ago, this would have never happened. No offense to anyone who's been in Art Table a long time, but it's true. Um, you know, so I think that you might not see what you're doing that way, but this is activism, creating space for this dialogue. So when the luncheon happens, they're not the same five people in the room. That's exciting. Um, so there's different ways to, I say this all to say that leadership and activism has many forms, and I think if we you know, sort of just dig deep within ourselves, what can you do? Um, within your own lives and own practices um, to just move the dial a little bit is really important. You have to start the conversation somewhere, right? Exactly. And we have one more question for you before we turn to the audience, and I'll make it a light one. Don't you ever just want to go see an exhibition that's just really pretty and has nothing to do with politics, <laughs> has nothing to do with anything else in the world where you can just hide? And it's like reading a book, you know, about, you know, something else that, because there's so much of it, right? We all hear so much of it, see so much of it every day, and we all love art or we wouldn't be here. Um, and I know we've all used it as an escape before, but when it becomes this political kind of thing in our work and every, you know, part of our lives, 
can you still escape with the beauty of art? <laughs> well, I'll take that one. <laughs> I think it's a privilege to escape with the beauty of art. I have many things that I love, um, but just to drive the point home, yeah, I could, you know, I could go to, um, I'm sorry, the name of the institution is uh, escaping me. Um, there have many awkward interests, let's say. Um, and sometimes I might find myself in an institution that's not used to seeing me. So I could be at the Frick, or I could be someplace else. And everyone else, I'm trying to enjoy the artwork like everyone else, and people are like, what are you doing here? So some of us don't have the opportunity to escape from the politics of just being. So yes, I would absolutely love to go enjoy art for the sake of enjoying art. But sometimes people have to understand that the reason why we're always talking about this is because we're always having to think about it, you know? So yes, that would be nice. It was a heavy answer for a light question, but I dig it. Right. God, I forgot. <laughs> <It's> fine. <laughs> I don't do light well. I'm sorry, audience. Unless there's tequila involved. Trying to end on a light note, Tiana. <laughs> no, it's, everything you're saying is factual. I, um, <laughs> I also kind of would love to escape. I feel like every time I walk into a museum, wonder, and then there's the work, and sometimes I can't turn off the work brain, I'm like, oh, wow, like, that security guard, you know, like, I want to talk with them about their, you know, body language and <laughs> the way they're welcoming people, like, oh, that gallery guy, like, I want to talk to them about using the term enslaved person instead of slave. Like, I always, I can't, I can't turn it off. So I usually escape to the movies. <laughs> Sorry. I, I also think there's an argument to be made that, like, you can't really escape the politics even in beauty and in beautiful images or like if you're talking about pure form, um, I think it's pretty impossible it, given our lived reality um, to dodge politics in any sort of image making environment, um, even especially if you take into context sort of um, the images of, you know, what I think you're thinking of as like these beautiful images, if they're part of a vocabulary, like you're describing in, a, in an environment where you have uh, entire systems built to sustain power and privilege, um, that for me it's hard to, um, to separate, but I also think that, that um, there's certainly no harm in enjoying um, the, the sort of pleasures of art as you engage in the politics of it as well. I don't think they're mutually exclusive, but I, I, don't, I, I don't know that you can have um, a pure form of art without politics. Well, I would agree with that too. And I would even point to the, the material that constitutes an artwork that itself is also you know, politically, um, uh, or a, a, um, evidence of a political process, even in the case of an abstract painting that is incredibly beautiful. And I certainly agree with you that um, you know, there is no reason to assume that political art cannot be beautiful. I think it's some of the most beautiful and most enjoyable work for me. It's funny that we bring up this topic because um, my first job was in very close proximity to um, a number of works or people that are considered part of the um, canon of abstraction. And the other day I was thinking about uh, Pollock and Ellsworth Kelly and Bryce Martin and for many years, I actually, you know, enjoyed the work. And more recently, I said to myself, what the hell were they doing while all this other stuff was going on in the world? Like, they were able to just paint this random stuff while people were, like, dying and being denied their rights and there were wars and they were just painting in circles and squiggles. You know, so it's so funny what you're saying enjoying because for many years, you know, I was able to enjoy, enjoy the work. Um, but now it, everything is colored um, differently just by what we're faced with in day to day. Yeah, and maybe that was their escape. Yeah, and, and to just push back on some of that a little bit, I think that uh, 
like there's all kinds of um, response to like political discord um, in, I agree that it's an incredible privilege to be able to, you know, render joking, abstract though. any of these things. But just to sort of hit home this idea that like there is no art without politics, that even the most abstract image is informed by a political moment, um, and that the context for any sort of work renders it political. And even just the fact of an art being in a public space, the fact of an object existing in the context of an audience politicizes it immediately. So we are almost ready for questions from the audience, but I think, Monica, you wanted to pose a question to the audience. Did you have something in mind to kick things off? I wanted to take an excerpt of what you said, Tiana. Um, <laughs> Earlier, you were saying, how can we kind of push the dial of our practice forward? Say, say it for me again. It was like, how can we be more, but not to put you on the spot, it's kind of how could we be more progressive? Like, even if we can't go big, like, what are the small things we can do to, to push? Individually. Individually. Indi right. right. Individually. What, what can we do? I would pose to the audience, turn and talk to your neighbor. <laughs> what? can we do to push things forward individually? And then Jessica's gonna yeah. lead us in something. Imogen, I think um, Julia, up front, Julia up front. I don't know necessarily that this will answer the question, but it might be an example of. I, I, I'm gonna bring up two points um, that go back to earlier comments that you all m made. Um, Fernando Botero did a very extensive series on Abu Ghraib, when Abu Ghraib occurred. He did the paintings and he showed them all at Marlborough, where he ha has been for years. Um, so this touches upon a lot of these points. Um, I, taught, I, I saw the series there and I saw the series in, in Chile at the Museum of Memory and Human Rights. Um, when they were shown, when they were made, and then when they were shown, with, they, were, they were done so with the explicit understanding that none would be sold. And none were sold. And he wanted them to live uh, and, and tell that story um, about injustice and criminality and violence um, in a museum which would make this happen. Well, apparently, so I came to learn, many American museums did not accept the work. It finally found its home in Berkeley. So we have an answer to a lot of these points that have been brought up. Um, I can't remember the name of the exhibition that occurred maybe 10 years ago at the Jewish Museum. But, but somebody here may remember it and, and, and it, and it talks to a lot of these points. The um, iconography that, that the diverse artists used had to do with circumstances that were central to the Holocaust. And, uh, Mirroring uh, evil, right? Yes. Curated Thank by Norman Kleback. By Kleback, exactly. And none of, I, I think none of the artists were Jewish. Um, I remember his saying, um, you know, they, they, they give panels afterwards, or they hold panels or symposia during their exhibitions. And during that exhibition, he, he said that he had to go and teach the board, um, which is where the, the conservatives or orthodox, the, um, anyway, the seminary, uh, in on the Upper West Side, um, they're not. It's not. It's not a reform congregation. It's not a reform board. So anyway, the point is the following: in order for that show to have taken place and been accepted, a lot of preparation, several years went into it, which goes to this point of of, of that kind of sensitive subject that was at the Whitney Museum. You, you do, in some way, have to prepare your board and the people you're working with and your audiences who are going to see it because people could get extremely upset. When I first saw Ivan Navarro's um, coffee table, 
um, where the base was a swastika. I mean, I, I went, what? And you know, as I knew him, I thought, this, this, I mean, this can't possibly be an anti-Semitic moment. And, and, and so I learned about it, and of course it wasn't. And it has a fascinating history. But you see, if it's, not, it's not there as the swastika. It's why he used it and where he got it from and what it meant to him. And it's, so all of these things do have to be um, dealt with. And I thank you all for your really interesting comments. Thanks, Julia. Do we have some other questions? Um, so I guess I, I thought again about the Whitney question. And it made me think about the fact that um, I wonder sometimes if in the art world, and I work at a design museum, so I think in the design world as well, if we kind of don't necessarily accept the word radical in all of its meanings. So the word radical comes from the Latin word radix, which means root. And so when a lot of people, I think, think of radical, they think of something that's not mainstream, something that's different, revolutionary, something that's out of the norm. But I do think that the Whitney show and the protester being there, and I think the Whitney kind of not knowing what to do, not knowing how to react, I think is a moment that's radical because it exposes the roots, I think, of what museums are about, what they're trying to do, how they operate. So I wonder if, is there a way, I think, that museums or artists um, or curators, when they're doing a work or an exhibition, if they can find a way, I think, to bring the public into these kind of unpredictable, emergent kind of uh, events of radical, I think, radicalism, I guess, of, of exposing the roots of the way that we understand, right? And I think that that means leaving, leaving room for misrecognition and misunderstanding. I think those are two kind of experiences that I think um, artists and, I, and even activists and museums try to kind of get away from or try to remove. And I don't know if that's the right thing to do. I don't, I don't know what that looks like, but I wonder what if we became proactive, I think, about encouraging people to be honest in their misrecognition of either themselves or the work or the artist or the institution. And I think a misunderstanding um, as well. What, what does that look like um, in terms of an art practice, an active practice of misrecognition and misunderstanding? I think that's amazing, first and foremost, um, from just uh, a process standpoint. Um, what I, I love that, but I guess my question would then be, how do you, is it the institution's responsibility to then capture that person before they go out the door to help educate them? Um, and then from a process standpoint, how would you then do that? But I think that that's the power of art is that moment of discovery and that moment of discomfort. Um, not always discomfort, it can be beautiful. You're starting to learn my tendencies, but um, that moment of discomfort, you know, um, and then how, how do we capture someone before um, that? I mean, I think what an interesting, Adrian Piper's exhibition um, was phenomenal in that uh, unfolding of idea and purpose. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that's a really fascinating question. Yeah, I think too being open to not just um, the institution educating the public, but being open to the public educating the institution. Um, and I think that that can happen in a lot of different ways, but one of the ways that, um, that I think you can build an organization to encourage that kind of practice is again um, not only focused on not only focusing energy on an object in a gallery, but in really placing a lot of energy around relationships and thinking about um, really actively building a, a vibrant public that's reflective of a dialogue that you want to have, um, rather than sort of again. Um, sort of recreating an echo chamber and... Um, I think that might also necessitate that these conversations or these 
this coming together takes place outside the institution um, because it's ne never a neutral ground, you know, if you meet somewhere. So um, a form of displacement, I think, would, could lead to a first indication of humility and willingness and um, sincere willingness to learn and observe and look, for starters. And I would just say that, you know, leaning into dissonance um, as a practice that we all could cultivate, but certainly institutions being willing to do that, that is radical. And if somehow that could be archived and documented for future generations to learn from, you know, here was a misstep or here was a time the community had to school us and let us know and call us out and say this is unacceptable. But then, as you said, going outside the institution, being willing to learn from publics and saying, okay, and here's how we thought of it differently and we leaned in and we didn't run and we didn't call our crisis PR people like that is truly radical. Hey, we're necessary. I'm just joking. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I just wanted to say one quick thing um, with regard to that. The other the other sort of thought about what you asked was um, I can be sort of a traditionalist, and I love sitting next to Allison because she's talking about the public's coming in um, and sort of informing the dialogue. And then you think about the institutions. Who are in the institutions? If you have had to suffer through a PhD program, you believe that you know it all. You have had the blood, sweat, and tears, and it is your job to tell people how to think. So I think that the other challenge that we have is the hierarchical nature of the institution and making sure that institution is even equipped being taught in a certain structure and canon and perspective to educate the public that we're even talking about. So that also is a challenge. Hi, um, I'm, I'm curious um, a little bit about um, weaving these conversations together in terms of um, needing to have dialogue and who's educating whom and who are the publics and can, who are institutions accountable to? Um, and then the comment around, um, you know, the people in power are usually the boards, or you know, like the we don't really support culture on a political, governmental way. Um, and I'm I'm kind of curious about how those conversate, how how those two things meet, um, because I don't know, um, I'm not quite sure what we're naming here in terms of how that power and institutions perpetuating structural racism because that's the status quo and that's how we maintain that power and the, the capturing of wealth in those spaces to do whatever you want in those spaces. Um, with the publics coming in and this education piece, I'm just curious how, how those two spaces meet in, in your work personally or in how you sort of engage in the world at, because you're, you're, you're engaging all in, of course, multiple layers, but in different layers. Um, and I'm curious how your work, you see your work kind of collapsing into perhaps a representation of the ecosystem and where you might enter into the, those two um, levels meeting. I'll jump in. Um, I feel like if you have the energy and the time, <laughs> there's a lot that you can do to chip away at different layers and to, like you said, net weave different layers. In my work um, as a consultant, I do a lot of executive advisement. I work with executives um, in the UK, helping them think through things, um, things sometimes they don't want to talk to their staff about or they can't receive the knowledge from their staff, so kind of advising them in a variety of circumstances, um, and then also doing trainings for staff, trainings for boards, um, trainings for anyone working within an institution on how to be more equitable in their public facingness. And then on another layer, um, through the work of Museum Hue, we're really big advocates in helping get people of color into the professional roles in these spaces that often have held us back um, or that we haven't been um, as welcome to or say, oh, we can't find any people of color. Museum Hue exists to counter that reality and bring agency and center people of color. And so helping people get jobs, making sure the next generation of careerists in museum spaces is coming in with a certain framework. That's another way to chip away at it. On certain semesters I teach, I've taught at NYU and Pratt and Harvard, classes around museums and social justice. So that next generation coming up is gonna come with a certain ethic. And then on top of all that, you know, when I'm like, wow, well, no one will let me put the art that I think is valuable on the walls, then curating. And I, I don't, curates exclusively in galleries or museums. We go to community spaces, we go to homeless shelters, we go to schools, we go to universities, we go to churches, and we curate and bring the 
content to where the people are, where the critical masses are. So that's another set of work. So from all these different angles, I'm trying to leave this legacy um, that things need to be dismantled and things can be rebuilt. I think another um, strategy can be um, maintaining levels of accountability so that your programs reflect the ethos of your staff and that your staff reflects the ethos of your program. So if you're purporting to um, you know, create a more inclusive creative community, you have to have a staff and a board that reflect that ethos as well. And I think it's oftentimes the part that organizations miss um, is having the, the sort of personnel factor and the board and the, um, the team uh, reflect, again, the, the ethos that is um, much more public facing in the programs. Um, but I also think that one way to get there is to have more of a porousness among these sort of groupings that we tend to um, think of as really separate. So, um, you know, we tend to think of an organization as having a board that is very separate from their public or um, the program participants. Um, but one of the things that um, that I that we try to do a lot at recess is. Um, create inroads for our program participants to then become workforce at the organizations that um, that we think are wonderful cultural organizations. So one of our main programs at Recess um, is called Assembly, and it's an artist-led diversion program for court-involved youth. Um, and the young people that come through that program also become the staff of the organization. And you talk, you use the word ecosystem, which I really appreciate in the context of um, this work, um, specifically work toward equity and inclusivity. Because I think unless you have a system in which your program participants have pathways to leadership, um, then then you're sort of shooting yourself in the foot. Um, I would maybe add to that um, and echo what you said that the the governance or the governing bodies of an institution need to reflect uh, the and represent the constituency of, of the institution, which is the staff and the public. But in addition, maybe going back to what you said, uh, Tiana, about um, being a interpreter. I mean, we're also mediators, and I think we create our publics through the way we address them. So you have the artwork, you know, which might be a finite or a finished object, but then the way you actually position that in a certain context determines entirely who is actually going to see it. And I'm really talking about curatorial, you know, basic skills of language and signage or no signage. So, you know, there's a lot of um, skills that we have in defining how we want to address a public and that creates the public in not the artwork alone it's also how we talk about it that actually brings a public into being and to piggyback off of what you said um i think it all collapses it all coalesces because you know we and then the royal we um all of you in this room we're all pushing towards something. And what's interesting for me, how my activist practice works, which I feel like I am exposing myself. Where's this video going? I'm exposing myself. Um, <laughs> but for me, I'm very interested in the power structures um, of these institutions. So I play a role in who is on the board. How do you cultivate a board? How do you create a pathway to the board? Where do you spend your resources? Do you know that you should be on a board? And why should you be on a board? Because you have to understand the exclusionary sort of system that's happened has excluded. I have people who have degrees from Harvard University who are not comfortable in museums. So making sure that people understand why these institutions are important why they need to be involved and invested in them and how to become part of them and how to get that position is sort of, that's not my, that's not what I get paid to do, but that's my activism. Um, sort of affecting those spaces, making sure that people are collecting, um, actively supporting the artists because I think that, you know, all of this work is important. You guys are, you know, pushing in from the public side and, 
actually you're pushing in from multiple sides and you know but there is still a power dynamic this is still about resources um, so for me it's very important to rally the people with resources whether it be educating them or bringing new people with resources to the table thank you we are out of time and I think we could go on forever because this is such a great topic. Um, do you want to say a few closing remarks, Whitney? Well, firstly, just this is obviously like a very good practice and a very good feeling for us all because these are decisions we have to make in our daily lives, right? This is like part of our, our living, breathing reality. So thank you all for sharing your personal experiences. Just really helpful and cathartic, I think, in some ways. Um, and also, thank you all for coming and participating in this dialogue. And if you want to hang around afterwards and chat, we would really appreciate that. Um, like I said in the beginning, our table is uh, effectively a membership organization, but we also foster a lot of this type of dialogue and um, hope to continue to foster this type of dialogue. So please ask me about that. And thank you, Jessica, for moderating this panel and for leading our organization so well. Thank you. Thank you.